Hello everybody and welcome to another little sit down and chat with me. Now don't worry I'm not intending to carry on doing several of these every week. As you might have guessed I'm now coming to the end of the content that I had recorded before restrictive mobility came in in the UK and luckily enough these measures are now being eased so I am now able to go out and start filming again and I'm doing that and you've got lots of amazing content to look forward to because over the last couple of months I have had an enormous number of cars offered to me, many of which are pretty incredible, some of which you might not have seen on YouTube before so I'm really looking forward to getting out and getting back to work. If you do happen to have a car or vehicle of some kind you think that you would like to see on the channel that I might be interested in, please do email me at the usual address which will be in the description down below. So, the topic for today's video, this crazy and relatively recent trend for obscene hypercars. Now, the hypercar is something that's really been around for a little while. I suppose in many ways you could almost look at something like, say, the Ferrari F40 as one of the first hypercars, but for me it began more really in the era of, say, the Carrera GT, stuff like that, with it really being cemented sort of later on in that decade. Now, I don't know about you, but when the latest hypercar Holy Trinity came out, I was genuinely excited. 918, LaFerrari, McLaren P1, that was a momentous occasion. And probably so, because it had been a decade since we'd had a grudge match like that. When this is the sort of thing that happens once every 10 years, it is special. It is something to celebrate, and I don't mind it at all. But now we seem to have these cars coming out on a weekly basis. And that just means it doesn't really feel that special anymore. And there are a lot of names that are perhaps synonymous with the hypercar. Pagani, Koenigsegg, and such like. But... In the last few years, we seem to have seen an explosion in this really weird ultra-niche marketplace for sort of two million pound, super crazy fast, obscenely engineered vehicles. And I think it is, for the most part, a very bad thing. I don't want the cars to stop existing, and there are many companies for whom these are the right cars to be making. Bugatti, Pagani, Koenigsegg, those guys, they have built their entire business around serving that market sector. They clearly understand how buyers of those cars work and what they want. More importantly, what they can afford and how many cars they can sell. If you look at the production numbers of these companies, you'll find that in most cases they're selling double digits of cars a year and often not high double digits. Koenigsegg, as an example, has an aim to make a hundred cars a year soon. That sounds like a sort of very, very small amount, but to a company like Koenigsegg, that is a huge number of cars. That is pretty much mass production. To give you an idea, in the 1990s, that's actually a similar amount of cars to what Lamborghini sold every year. In the mid-90s, they were selling only one to three hundred cars a year. So it's not actually that surprising a number. What is surprising is how the prices of these things have changed. When the Pagani Zonda was introduced, it cost something like just over $300,000. Now, if you want to buy a Wira, you're paying easily over $2 million. Now, why has this happened? Well, I think a lot of it has been driven by the crazy increase in classic car prices. I used to work with a Porsche dealership who specialised in creating the sort of back dates, you know, the 2.7 RS evocations, that sort of thing. And the big problem 10 years ago was the fact that you would easily be spending £130,000 on one of their bespoke creations when you could have actually bought the real deal for not a lot more. As soon as buying the real one turns into a half million pound car, or sometimes more, justifying £100,000 on a fake one is a lot easier to do. And the same thing, I'm sure, has happened with these companies. You know, why on earth would you buy a, uh, let's just say, a, a Ferrari inspired by your favourite retro Ferrari from 30 years ago when you can actually buy the real deal from 30 years ago for the same money? Of course, the minute they become 20, 30 million quid to a lot of people, that becomes unobtainable. And here's my first problem with these this kind of car, this category. Now, I've got a few tabs open in my internet browser here just to sort of give me a few card cues, as it were. We've got the usual candidates, Pagani, Koenigsegg, but there are a lot of new players as well. We've got Rimac, and Rimac seem to be a company that 
kind of doing okay. And again, it's a company that's entirely built around this market segment. But you've got Ferrari too. Again, I suppose a somewhat traditional player and they've entered this marketplace, not with LaFerrari, but with the Monza, which I see as being part of this kind of category that I'm talking about. You've got things like the Bentley Bacalar, you've got Singer, you've got uh, Di Tommaso, uh, you have the Lotus Evaya. There's, there's a whole, whole bunch of other companies, uh, Brabham. They're all looking at producing these cars and they're all taking slightly different routes. Some are trying to make a super luxurious road car. Some are making hardcore track cars. Some are trying to pretend you can have both at the same time. All that jazz. But here's the big thing. These are stupid amounts of money. These are really crazy, silly, obscene amounts of money. The minute you start talking about two million pounds or whatever for a car, that's a lot. I've seen Tim Shmi150 talk about this in threads before, that we look at, say, something like a McLaren Senna, and you think, well, if you can afford one of those, surely you could afford a Pagani, but actually it's, it's, it's like triple the price. It, it'd be like me saying like, well, you can afford a, a Ford Focus, so of, of course you could afford you know, a McLaren 570. Well, no, they're, they're, they're totally, totally separate price points. And it's a price point which is just utterly and totally unattainable. Just, just for even wealthy people, even really wealthy people, people that have been really successful, you know, people uh, like Tim, uh, people like Damien at The Car Guys, I'm pretty sure he probably would not want to spend the amount of money that it would take to buy a Pagani. Uh, Harry from Harry's Garage, again, talked about he owned a Pagani. And the problem was, even when they weren't that expensive, the running costs of these things are absolutely obscene. And for most car collectors, you do have to look at the cost of buying one of these and what else you could have in your collection for the same money. And then for mortal people like myself, it's just never, ever gonna happen. When Pagani's were sort of three, four hundred thousand pounds, it's that sort of thing where I thought, oh, yeah, you know, maybe one day, oh, that could be, you know, if you were lucky and you, you did well and, you know, you inherited a bit of money or, or something like that, you know, you're like, oh, okay, maybe one day I could afford something like that. Well, I've got no chance. Ne never, never, ever going to happen. No way. I was about to say in a month of Sundays, and what we've just had is two months of Sundays. And uh, yeah, no, it's just... It's not going not gonna to work, is it? And for that reason, I think a lot of people are just not so interested in these cars. They're not so excited about them because they seem like cars that are just so completely unattainable. They're just so distant, so far away. I found an old copy of Autocar from the mid-90s, and in there they have Ferrari F40s listed at £170,000, which is what I remember them being. Ferrari Dinos were £50,000. You know, an old Ferrari was cheaper than a new Ferrari. That's kind of how it was. And in many ways, that was sort of, for me, the best way for things to be, because it meant that the people that bought these cars were the people that really wanted them, really lusted after them, and they bought them because that's what they wanted. That was the car that they wanted. And they were happy to put up with the many, many compromises that were going to be involved in owning and running one of those cars. The minute they became a tool for collectors and speculators, that just took so much of the fun out of it. These cars just got tucked away. And, and that's what really, I think, makes me so sad, is the, the idea that so many of these wonderful, brilliant cars are just hidden, just stuffed in a corner, never to be seen again. Because for me, the joy of cars is sharing them. If ever I'm in the position again where I can own a really nice, truly special car, I am going to drive it all the time. I'm going to share it as much as I possibly can. As what I loved most about owning a Lotus is that it's the social side of things. It's the talking to people, the making friends through cars, all that sort of jazz. And I'm quite confident many of you agree. And the other thing is that I think with these cars that they are something of a big risk to the companies making them. Now, while things were all sunny, rosy, and numbers were only going up, I'm sure these cars seemed like a, a very obvious way to make quite a bit of money. And there's two methods companies generally seem to have taken to produce these cars. Now, you could take the McLaren method, where you take a uh, relatively lazily engineered car, for example, Elva, it's a 720 with the roof off, and you stick an obscene price tag on it under the guise of exclusivity. 
or you take, say, a different route, probably the Zinger route, for example, or the Rimac route, and you spend a huge amount of money, uh, R&D, development, engineering work, knowing you're only ever going to produce a very small number of these vehicles, so you've got to recoup your cost, and, and you wind up with an expensive price tag that way. And both of these methods have, of course, their own risks. If you go the McLaren route, I think you'll find that as soon as the market gets even a little bit shaky, people will look at what they're buying into and they'll question it and go, hmm, do I really want to be buying that? Is my money going to be safe? Are people going to see straight through it? And I think in that case, people have seen straight through it. Uh, the emperor is running around in the buff and as a result, nobody is buying into it. Now, on the other side of things, the Rimac route and potentially even the Lotus route as well, if companies are spending so much money developing these cars, Aston Martin doing the same thing, they're developing new powertrains and they're presumably charging the amount of money that they are because they kind of have to if they want to turn a profit. Well, it doesn't take a specialist, an economist or a former car company CEO to work out if you're selling only a hundred of a product, and let's just say you've spent, you're getting two million quid in for each car. Well, that's 200 million you're getting back in. Now, it wouldn't take very many cancelled orders to put a huge dent in your revenue for that car. And if you've been charging the amount you're charging because you need the money back to recoup your R&D costs, I think you very, very quickly wind up in a situation where the car you make is going to cost you a lot of money. Now, it wouldn't be the first time in history that's happened. I mean, Bugatti sold Veyrons at full price and still lost money. So it's not inconceivable to think that perhaps some of these companies were building these cars with no intention of really making money off them anyway. But you then wind up in a situation where actually this brilliant, new, wonderful flagship car you've built just cost your company 100 million at a time where you really, really can't afford it. It's happened before, Jaguar XJ220, and it will happen again. For companies like McLaren, if you're selling these cars with the intent of simply raising an awful lot of cash because you've put a massive margin on something, if they fail to sell, that's a big problem because again you're going to have a very big hole in your finances. These are risky cars, this is a risky strategy and unfortunately even at this super high end bit of the market I'm just not sure that people are still going to be buying these cars in anywhere near the quantities that manufacturers hope that they will. This is a, a very very small fish and loaf that they're trying to feed a lot of people with. I just can't possibly see it working. Now, for companies like Pagani, Koenigsegg, those guys, and Bentley and, and Bugatti, uh, they are going to be fine. They're going to be absolutely fine. I think they're smart. They've built their heritage. They've built their brand. Yeah, I'd love to have a wire at half a million, but I, I know it's just not going to happen. That's fine. So other companies that I worry for more. Not Ferrari. They're Ferrari. They'll be fine. Um, Lotus in particular are very, very confused about their decision to make a via. I've never really understood the point of it. I've never understood what the message is they're trying to send with that car. You know, it's the Keith Lemon thing. What's the message? You know, um, Lotus have spent the last two, three decades trying to tell people light is right, lightweight is better, lightweight this, lightweight this, lightweight this. And now they're going, actually, no, sorry. I know we said lightweight. What we meant was you'll want the most powerful production car ever made. And ignoring the fact that a 2,000 horsepower, 2 million pound car is just unnecessary, I found it particularly galling that Lotus decided to launch that car with the tagline, for the drivers. I think when they said for the drivers, what they meant was for the extremely well-heeled Japanese collectors who are going to buy it and stick it in their underground lockups in Tokyo. Because that's the truth of it, isn't it, guys? I, I mean, Lotus is a brilliant brand, and I absolutely love it for one very simple reason. If you're out and about and you see someone driving a Lotus, I guarantee you that person is a proper petrol head. They love their car. It's like bumping into bikers outside the M25. You know, bikers are great. Bikers love 
bikes. They know their bikes. If you ask a biker what they ride, they won't just say, oh, it's a blue one, I think. Um, Lotus guys are like that. They are very passionate. They're amazing people. Some of the best car owners as a whole that are out there. And the general thing, most Lotus owners don't really have huge sums of money. I think if Lotus were to introduce a McLaren priced vehicle, and I don't mean Elva, I mean like 570 priced vehicle, there's a huge market for that. And I really, really hope the next car that they release, which is going to be combustion engined and maybe the new Esprit, I genuinely don't know, complete uh, conjecture on my part. Um, I, I really, really hope that that is the car that they get really, really right. Because to be quite honest, Evaya just makes no sense. It's not appealing to existing Lotus customers. The sort of people that own a Lotus that'll buy Evaya are the people that own one of the old Lotus Formula One cars. That's, that's simply it. The other thing with Evaya uh, that, that is a bit risky is that because they're telling everyone that this is the fastest thing ever, I, um, I really hope it is because Lotus historically have never really gone to tracks to set times and things like that and for the very simple reason that if they did uh, they would not be very impressive ones. But with Evaya they've essentially said yep no fastest car in the world, best car in the world, it's brilliant. And so what Lotus need to do, if they want to have a chance in hell of selling any of these things, they need to go to uh, the Nürburgring, they need to go to Spa, they need to go to Laguna Seca, they need to go everywhere they can with this car. And they need to not, not just beat by a little bit, but they need to obliterate any track record anywhere. That's what they need to do. And I think that's the only way they're going to sell these cars. They originally claimed that they'd sold all of them, which is 130 of them. Then they backtracked and said they'd sold out their first year's production, but haven't been very clear as to how many cars that is. I frankly would be absolutely astonished if they've got orders, real orders, for more than about a, a dozen of them. Um, I, just, I just can't see it. I don't think Lotus has the desirability as a brand that some of these other companies do, uh, even the likes of, say, Di Tommaso, that hasn't really existed in any meaningful way for a long time, uh, possibly better than the situation Lotus is in, which is where they've cultivated an image um, that doesn't work. F from a Lotus-specific perspective as well, and I appreciate I've gone down a bit of a lotus -y rabbit hole, but I, I love my Lotus. I'm very passionate about them. Um, it's a very odd message to send to your existing customers that, you know, they've got all this money in, all these billions of Chinese money, and this is the first thing that they want to build. This is the car that represents the new Lotus. And if I was currently a Lotus owner, I'd be very worried. And it seems very odd because at the minute, Lotus don't really know how to build a £50,000 car or to look after a customer that spent that amount of money. So I do not know how they intend to look after customers spending £2 million. And then generally you get onto this whole thing of people don't use these cars. They're not they're not driven, they're not out and about, and that applies to all of them. And for me, that's the saddest thing, because you're not really going to inspire future petrol heads with cars that they never see, that they can't afford, that do things which are pretty meaningless. Now, I'm actually very thankful in some ways to the electric hypercars, and I will include Evi in that, because I think there is a generation of petrol heads out there, or potential petrol heads, that are actually very eco-conscious. I've spoken to at least one driving instructor who tells me that a lot of people are sort of getting put off driving because of the environmental aspect. So if we can give people this idea that these electric hypercars can be exciting and green, then there's some hope there. It's not where I want the industry to go, but if it's going to go there, then let's at least try and make it the best that we can. Let's try and make it as good as we possibly can. Ultimately, I think this is probably where we're going to end up. Yeah, there's loads of arguments that hydrogen will be better, but in the short term, electric seems to be where we're going to go. And I actually quite enjoy electric cars, driven quite a few, really like them. Are they perfect? No, but I could see myself owning one. For now, I'm going to try and own as many of the exciting old school things as I can. But I really, really do want to see manufacturers sort of just knuckling down and trying to focus on the sort of core audience. I appreciate that that's difficult. A lot of manufacturers are streamlining their ranges. I saw a piece the other day about the fact that Renault are now not going to be making anywhere near as many cars as they used to. Maybe that's a good thing. I think manufacturers have been spreading themselves far too thin. They've got far too many models in the lineup. Uh, the last Audi press tour I went to, they proudly told us they had something like 50 models, something like that. 
And when you know that, it's no surprise that many of them are pretty much the same. I personally would rather a return to the old days where manufacturers told customers what they wanted and gave them the choice of, you know, four or five good cars rather than 50 mediocre ones. That's, and I'm not saying Audi make 50 mediocre cars, by the way. There's plenty of good cars now. There's plenty of cars that I don't like. But the point is, how can a manufacturer be realistically expected to spend anywhere near as much time as you would like on developing a model when they've got so many to develop. It just doesn't make sense. And in an industry which is potentially shrinking, I don't think diversifying really works. And as far as flagships go, I fail to see the relevance of so many of these sort of two million quid cars. I don't think people are excited about them because they just know that they can't buy them, won't see them. I think they run the risk of causing more harm than good to their manufacturers financially, if nothing else. And I just don't think it's the way to get people excited about cars. I just don't. So yeah, there's a small brief rant about my opinion on the current hypercar craze. And I hope to see you all later on for my live stream, which is on Sunday, if you're watching this after the fact, I've been doing live streams every Sunday. And that may be something that I continue after all the madness ends as well. So thanks for listening. Bye-bye.